Good morning. Super excited about this panel. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of an area near and dear to my heart. And I wanted to explore a little thesis about how um, this, is un this is unfolding in Web3 maybe differently than we've seen it before. So specifically, um, I've been working in technology for over 10 years. And I've been always really focused on this intersection of communities and technology. And I think there's something really special there. And there's always been something really special there. Um, and I think that right now in Web3 that uh, it's really exciting. Before working in technology, I actually worked in science where I was really passionate about how to use technology to enable scientific communities um, to do bigger, greater things and bring in innovations like data visualization so that communities could sort of cross the membrane of science and non-science um, backgrounds. And so I'm really excited to have somebody from kind of do, doing that kind of work with technology and Web3 and scientists represented here as well. So when I started thinking about bringing these people together and Brian and my, on my team and I were brainstorming what kind of topics would be really interesting, I got, I got really focused on this idea that, um, that all the people on this panel in some sense are building technologies and, and innovating in order to bring communities together, in order to help uh, align and mobilize and empower people in different communities to do bigger and greater things. And oftentimes the things that those people in the community are doing are contributing and creating new technologies themselves. And so there's this really cool feedback loop of us creating technology that creates communities, that creates technology to, to empower more community. And I think that something that's really unique in Web3 is the speed at which we can close these feedback loops. And I think I'm seeing that happen at this community technology boundary in the feedback loop between the two. And I think these three people uh, are working on things that help make that feedback loop as fast as, as we've ever seen it. And so this is everywhere. It's in Lens Protocol, Rebel, LabDAO, also in Snapshot, Developer DAO, on Cyber. Just like the list goes on of these technologies that sort of sit at that membrane between um, hard technolo hardcore technologies and the communities that use them and then get deeper into them. And it fits this pattern of the feedback loops. So I don't know why it is. Maybe I'm wrong about that thesis. Maybe I'm right. Um, but I'm hoping that I can kind of explore the idea with these three people and we can get to the bottom of what's really going on. So I want to give each person here uh, an opportunity to introduce themselves and maybe I'll just move clockwise around the uh, around the circle. So if you could each just share a little bit about your background and who you are and what you work on, um, starting with Akash. Thanks, Andrew. Really happy to be here. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Akash. I'm core team member at LabDAO, uh, where I do a lot of the, lead a lot of the tech stuff that we're building out there. Prior to LabDAO and entering the Web3 world head on, I spent a lot of time in pharma and biotech, uh, primarily focused on clinical R&D research and uh, wearables and sensors. How do you track uh, patient conditions uh, throughout the course of a clinical trial utilizing wearables and sensors. Um, so not quite Web3 decentralized, but the use of distributed technologies um, to better patient, uh, patient care. And I'm really excited about LabDAO just because I think there is, like you said, Andrew, so much potential for feedback loops in science and um, I just think that uh, Web3 can really accelerate the progress of science in general. Maybe uh, jumping right on to Mike. Cool. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and to chat about community and technology with all of you. Um, I'm working on a project called Rebel. And we are a complete toolkit for Web3 creators. So we help anybody who makes, <clears throat> uh, if you make podcasts or videos or any kind of traditional creator economy type content, uh, we help with publishing and like decentralized content publishing and engaging a community. So we have really cool community stuff like contests and token gated forums and all kinds of things that can help uh, connect members of your project and help facilitate communication. Um, I'm 
main like web three, I think really opens up the doors to innovation where when it comes to community and social and um, I think like media um, and just collaboration in general, like web two is kind of plateaued or stagnated. And I think that web three has really opened the door to all kinds of interesting um, new mechanics that we can sort of discover uh, to, to really push things forward. So I'm excited to be working in this industry. I've been super stoked to work with Tableland and I'm excited to hear what everybody else on this call has to, to say about all these things. Yeah, thanks. Uh, okay, over to you, Nader. Hey, yes. Um, I've been in uh, the blockchain space for almost two years now. I've been in developer education uh, in some form or fashion, probably for like seven or eight years. Though. So I've done everything from like uh, creating and hosting meetups, being a part of helping create coding schools, um, doing uh, actual one-on-one -on -one training with engineers around the world, uh, writing books. Uh, now I'm in doing developer relations, which kind of encompasses all of that uh, community and education educational aspect, which is something I really enjoy doing. And I'm um, the, the developer relations uh, director at Ave and Lens Protocol. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. So, yeah, so I, I think to kick this off and to really explore this thesis, I thought maybe I'd just kind of ask each of you some questions about the projects you're working on right now. And so maybe starting back with you, Nader, um, I was, I was thinking about Lens and it's it's a really interesting protocol and I've dug into it a bit at some past hackathons and I thought maybe the audience could get some orientation here if you could just share a little bit about what is Lens enabling people to do that they couldn't do before? And and then I guess I just a follow on question to that to maybe capture is, uh, do you think the protocol will give rise to new forms of community? Because I'm seeing some really interesting conversations about how people are using the protocol. And so maybe just speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I think that uh, there's a lot of stuff happening that, um, that it's enabled, which is like why I'm, why I'm here. Um, from the perspective of a developer, it actually really lowers the barrier to entry for application development. So you don't have to build out a backend. You don't have to build out a, uh, a data a, a data model for you know your your backend infrastructure you don't have to build an api you don't have to scale all the stuff you literally have like kind of a built-in uh back end that you can plug into with data and you can kind of uh, focus on just building out a, a differentiating uh, front-end experience so i think this is uh, already giving uh, rise to just a lot of applications that are just being able to be built extremely easily so uh, therefore you have kind of a lot of uh, the ability to experiment and uh from my experience at aws kind of providing a serverless infrastructure allowed for a lot of experimentation and allowed for in, uh, engineering teams to kind of iterate and come up with new ideas and throw the bad ideas out because they didn't have to worry about building out a lot of these other core components. And I think it's kind of bringing that same idea to uh, developers, but not only having the actual software infrastructure, but also having almost like an entire backend API that you can kind of just use and have a teams building out and improving for you. And you can kind of iterate and try stuff out. So therefore, um, you're seeing a lot of like different experiences, a lot of easy to spin up communities and ideas. And the, a lot of these communities are kind of niche. So you don't need to have like 100 million users for one of these to be successful. You could probably have a few, a few thousand or a few tens of thousands um, for it to be successful. So I think for the, for the developer, the differentiating uh, factor is that you have, first of all, this back end that's, that's kind of already They've been built for you and improved over time. But you also have a built-in user base. So you don't have to bootstrap uh, an entire user base. You literally have uh, over 100,000 users built in when you launch your app. And in the future, that will be millions. And uh, that's the two main uh, value propositions for developers. Uh, for, for creators and for users, uh, one of the, the value propositions is that you have a portable social graph. So every single application that comes on board from now and, and forever in the future you'll have users that are built in. So for right now, if you build out a, a, a following on Twitter and then uh, tomorrow a new social media app comes out like TikTok, uh, you have to kind of start from scratch there. And then another thing will be hot like a year later. Um, instead of having to kind of bootstrap your audience across every single platform, you kind of automatically have uh, that audience built in. Uh, you also have kind of um, new monetization built directly into the platform that a lot of people are being able to kind of use in new and interesting ways. So you have the ability to, to configure and, and if you're a developer, program different 
uh, I would say like on chain things that have to do with actions or, or what people have done in the past in order to monetize. So um, what, what interesting thing that's kind of happening is like uh, at scale, you don't have to actually charge a lot for, for something. I think like uh, in, in crypto and NFTs, you're kind of used to thinking of an NFT costing like a thousand dollars or a hundred dollars or uh, $10,000 or something that's out of reach for 99% of the world. Uh, but on, uh, on lens, um, people are like putting collect fees of like 10 cents or 50 cents or a dollar. But because there are over 100,000 people on the protocol, they're often being able to kind of get significant collects. So even if it's like 50 or $100, if you're just posting like a tweet, um, that's still like a decent amount of money, right? And it's kind of cool to be able to have that uh, built in. And this is kind of still in beta, closed beta. So I think like once we are, are out of closed beta and we have a lot more users, uh, we'll see a lot more um, activity even than that. Um, one good example of like uh, someone being able to make an impact there is someone that tweeted out or, or, or posted on Lens that they were leaving their job to work on Lens full time, uh, a new front end on top, top of Lens or a front end on top of Lens. And they set a $2 collect fee. And they had 10,000 people collect that. So at scale, that was $20,000 for a post. And uh, stuff like that is like really exciting, I think, to a lot of creators because uh, you just can't really do that. Uh, you don't have any control over that. And uh, there's a couple of other things, but I've already talked for a lot. So. <laughs> yeah, and that's awesome. And you, you kind of foreshadowed a lot of things I wanted to, I hope we get time to hit on today, which are like, um, one, I, I think that you've done a, 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 you've done a great job building a lot of different communities and thinking through these technologies. And I've seen this pattern of you being wet, much more attracted to technologies that are easy to use or, or obvious. And I, and I wanted to get kind of, I want to talk a little bit about how that's changed over the last two years. Another thing you touched on is the power of tokens. And we think about what technology we're all building and tokens is obviously one of the core technologies and thinking about how to use that in community. So let's put some flags in those and hopefully come back to them. So uh, for Akash, maybe could you explain a little bit about um, what LabDAO is doing specifically for science communities and, and what they can do with DAOs now that they couldn't do before? Um, and, and maybe also just thinking through like, how are scientists responding to that? How are they, how are they responding to Web3 generally? And how are they, how are they starting to think about um, what you're doing with LabDAO? So I'll start off with the, the latter half of that question. Um, I think sci a lot of scientists are pretty skeptical of Web3. Um, there's a significant onboarding challenge that we have to overcome um, just because, uh, you know, they see headlines here and there of like FTX or, you know, any number of like rug pulls. And so that has definitely been a little bit of a challenge, but <clears throat> I think to explain what we're trying to do at LabDAO, it helps to like frame it, the, the current state of science. So if you're a scientist uh, at a lab right now, typically you have to seek external funding to, uh, to, to fund your scientific research. Um, in the United States, this comes uh, oftentimes with biomedical research from the NIH, Nas National Institutes of Health. And this whole problem of receiving funding is, is quite significant because the large majority of scientific research funding goes to the Harvards, the MITs, these, you know, top tier institutions in, uh, by name. Um, and so a lot of scientists don't have access to funding. One of the things that we're trying to do at LabDAO is to reintroduce the meritocracy that comes for scientific research. So um, Nader, you were, you were talking about portable social graphs. Um, I think that's something that we definitely want to incorporate um, into LabDAO. If you are a scientist and you have a compelling um, idea for research, you should be able to receive that funding, regardless of like your current academic institution. Um, so building on building those credentials on chain is uh, very important to us. And one other thing that I'll say, um, this is its own rabbit hole, but I think it's worth mentioning right now, is if you think about the the development and the advance, the advancing of science, it's, it's its own like knowledge graph. Um, if um, the, the COVID vaccines that were, uh, that were approved um, comes from 
uh, early research that was done in the 90s for uh, mRNA vaccines. Uh, the, the, the majority of the financial returns for those mRNA vaccines are from like Moderna or Pfizer. You know, they, they, uh, they're the ones that are capitalizing on this. Whereas the scientists that actually did the early research, they're not getting too much of that money. And that's totally not fair. Um, and, and I actually think it's uh, kind of toxic to just clinical research in general. What we want to do at LabDAO is create a system where you can track, you can audit um, the growth and the advancing of scientific uh, ideas. And so what you can do if this is all done on chain is you can do retroactive funding. So someone that ran an experiment for that was a seedling for a product that ended up generating lots of money, you can actually send, you know, you, you can reward them retroactively, which I think is super exciting and hopefully should create a more um, thriving scientific uh, research landscape. I definitely want to keep coming back to this. It sounds like there's some really cool overlap about what we can do uh, uh, with tokens moving across sort of the network within these communities. And, and there seems to be some really good overlap there. Um, how about how about Rebel, Mike? What are the superpowers you saw were missing in communities that you thought new technologies could help solve? And, and what are you trying to do there? I think like ownership is, and this is kind of goes back to what Akash was saying, is that like the, the idea that being a contributor at any point along the um, way can result in getting something back from upside in an outcome or or just being part of the process is something that Web3 sort of unlocks that wasn't really possible before. Um, and kind of like what Nader was saying, like it, it can be big or small. I mean, the idea that you could, in uh, because it, it we're, we're tracking how money moves around um, in ways that don't involve costly, credit card fees and bank transfers and things like that. Um, it facilitate like it, it enables micro payments and, and the ability to track small transactions, but all the way up to larger scale things. Um, people who contribute big or small to projects can have upside in outcomes. And so ownership in whether it's intellectual property or products and services as they scale, the idea that like, oh, I brought a friend into this community. And because of that, I get a little piece of economic ownership or reputational ownership in the thing are huge. Um, so like, that's a pretty big superpower thing I think is great. Um, I also think that with information being on chain in this big global database, it allows for I, you could call it credentialing or reputation. I think this is like a major deal. Um, the idea that you can publicly display your contributions or things that you collect or curate. I mean, these are kind of like really abstract because it applies to scientific research and it applies to like media curation or participation. Like I think that this touches a lot of different areas of human behavior, but broadly speaking, just the idea that people can um, have this portable global profile of things that they are participating in and contributing to and that it unlocks the possibility of participation in upside economic or otherwise is something that just really hasn't been possible before and that we're in the very early stages of discovering the full potential of so those are like the major superpowers that i think about i also love the idea of permissionless like the composability and permissionless innovation I mean, it kind of goes back a little bit to some of the stuff nader was saying like one thing that's really been exciting about what's happening in the lens ecosystem is just the total like there are so many really good front-end apps being developed um and people can do this with the confidence of knowing that the underlying data and um structure of it all is going to remain because it's in this sort of immutable blockchain that 
you can have full confidence nobody can really mess with or change or suddenly cut off because it no longer agrees with their business goals or purposes, people are free to innovate. And so like there are tons of really cool clients, um, some of which that are on a long waiting list that maybe maybe you can bump me up on Nader, but otherwise are like really cool interpretations of how people should be building communities or sharing information or whatever. And so that ability to innovate and compete without the permission of some central platform or authority means there's a lot more competition. And I think a lot more, it'll be like a much faster acceleration of, of innovation and new stuff. So those are all things that I'm like mega exciting, excited about and are only possible because of the blockchain structure of it all. Can, can I ask a quick open question here? <clears throat> Um, yeah, so I'm I'm curious, like, what are the the friction points for individuals or applications starting to put that initial information on chain? Let's say it's tied to a lens protocol, because I think the idea of you know this like universal identity is so powerful. Um, how do you, how do communities tend to get started with that? So you're asking like how to how would a community get started with like one of these decentralized identities? Yeah, and like how would a community start like adding their information, like you know, having the buy-in? So the the reason I'm asking this question uh, right now in like in science, Google Scholar is really really valuable. You know, you can get your list of publications, the number of citations. Um, so like that's kind of the the web two I guess solution. How do you get people to like transition from that web two solution to like the web three one? Yeah, I think that it just comes down to uh, providing like a 10 X better product than like what existed before. I think most people don't care like uh, if it's blockchain or if it's web three or if it's like anything like that. Uh, I, I think that what we understand that is like the possibilities that we can kind of bring to the table through these primitives will offer a better, a much better overall like user experience and value proposition. But I think like the maturity of, of some of the actual products that are built with some of these protocols and, and things are quite, quite not, are not quite there yet for, for some people to kind of actually start making that transition. So I think as we see these uh, different solutions get better and better, that we'll see more and more people probably transitioning and, and, most of them won't transition because it's blockchain. They'll just transition because they think it's better to be able to kind of have that uh, single source of truth and that portability and uh, may, you know, and, and that ownership and that immutability and that censorship resistance and all those things that they can kind of get. But um, it's hard to just say like, you know, um, I just think that w the more experimentation that we see, you know, is, is obviously a good thing. But I think often what you also see is like competition, like people don't, want to use the, the thing that someone else is already building or even help them build that and said they want to build their own thing. And um, I don't, I, I don't know if that's like a good or a bad thing. It's hard to tell. I mean, experimentation is good, but at some point we have to kind of come to an agreement about like how we are, are going to do things and, uh, and work together. <laughs> I, there's two thoughts I had in that. Um, one is actually to that last point. I always felt like in web two, in the web two of 10 years ago, things were set up really well for like thousands of experimentations where um, where only the really best ones that got it right from, you know, talent, insight, and a bit of luck to be the right solution succeeded. And Web3 for the first few years struggled to be easy enough to allow those thousands of experiments. And now I feel like we're getting actually to your, your point on Lens earlier on, some of these primitives are getting good enough that we can experiment really fast and have a lot of failures. And I think that's good. The other thought I had just to your question um, is I, I feel like the motivations of people to move exactly to what Nader is saying, I think they can be broken down into just a few things. It's like either they can, you can earn them income, you can make them money. So they'll do things or you can make their lives easier. Um, so you save them time or you give them an experience that makes it better for them, um, but really breaks down to just makes it easier. Something that they want to do that's easier to do now or something they didn't know that they wanted to do, but when you show them, suddenly they want it and it's easiest to do on your platform. And anything else 
beyond those two, maybe there's a third I'm missing, but there's very few reasons, motivations that people will adopt new technologies. And I think like privacy and encryption, there's very small niches for people that wanted those. And Web3 spent a lot of time trying to build those things, but really we just need to, yeah, build the 10X better, like Nader is saying, and, and get people to just, and, and, and really expose what we do better and what values we can give users. And we'll get on that with tokens too. That, that third thing could be that Elon Musk buys Google Scholar and causes people to want to build the Web3 alternative. I mean, that might be the third. A version, reason. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I think, I think it points to, I think your question points to um, the opportunity that exists for builders right now in the Web3 space is that like, we, the big challenge is sort of building the right um, user experiences and the right narratives that, Commute that user experiences that are seamless and easy to use, and then the right narratives to communicate the value of being in this sort of like new version of the internet. You know, we call it Web3 or crypto or whatever. And I think both of those probably have branding difficulties with just mainstream regular people. Um, and I think the some of the biggest challenges in our industry at the moment are really narrative based. Um, and so I think the builders that are going to really cruise out in front of everybody else over the next couple of years are the ones who are going to be able to articulate why this stuff matters and have a great user experience waiting for, and, and like I, like the, the Elon thing is kind of a tongue in cheek joke, but it is, I think that like when events happen, like you have to be prepared for these sort of events that do occur that cause people to reconsider what's going on. Like there's always a moment of controversy or some big company messes up or there's this window opens where if you're in that place at the right time with the right narrative and product, you can really capitalize on that. I mean, Tumblr, tons of people like when with, through all of this drama with Twitter over the past month or what, however long it's been, Tumblr has seen a bunch of people signing up. Mastodon has tons of people signing up and florping and whatever it is they do there. And um like there, there are those, you have to be opportunistic, I think. So it's like, to me, I think those are really the key ingredients to like what will be breakout successes in the sort of web three space is like narrative, great user experience, and then being ready for opportunity when it comes knocking. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. So I, I think um, I was curious maybe to just throw my thesis out to you all. And I'm really curious um, what your reactions are, if you think that this is right. And so um, I guess to sum it up, the, the thesis I was trying to present at the beginning was that technology is being built for Web3 communities such that Web3 communities can build technology and that that feedback loop is faster than we've seen it before. And I've heard you all touch in some of your comments already on reasons why that might be like, it might be because of this sort of uh, different revenue, different revenue st streams for doing, to, for building or creating things for niche communities. Um, it might be, uh, um, it might be this idea that we all own the technology collectively, whereas in Web two, it's very hard to contribute to the technologies you're using as a community because that that technology is sort of top down and it's given to you, and then you you do something else with it, and so there's no real strong feedback loop, whereas we have it. Um, maybe some other ideas, but just throwing it out there, what are what are all your reactions to that? You think that I'm on to something with that? Do you think you feel it or sense it too? And what might be the reasons for it that that um, are interesting to you? I think that's definitely the case. I mean, I think it, the the token, the idea that um, tokens provide a much simpler equity model for participation in any of these ecosystems, whether it's Ethereum and ETH or Polygon and Matic or Optimism and OP. I mean, there's like every, so many of these projects have native tokens and or even NFT projects or DAOs having, however, they sort of tokenize their communities. To me, these are, it's like a radical innovation on what we typically have used corporations to represent, which is just like a collective of coordinated human activity. And because you can very easily become an equitable owner of these endeavors, just by either purchasing tokens or earning them through contributions or however you come upon them, um, 
it really aligns people's incentives in a way that has historically been pretty difficult or costly to do with the traditional structures that we've had. So to me, I think that's one of the major breakout, like to your thesis, I think it's right on. And I think that a major engine that moves it forward is just that sort of shared ownership and benefit to contributing stuff. Um, that's that's my like, sort of initial take to it. How about you, uh, Nader? I, I know you've been in the space for two years, which on one hand is old in this domain, on the other, it's pretty fresh. And I think, I feel like you sort of pretty quickly came to the scene and, and already were founding developer DAO. We're already part of a pretty big, and you think about what a DAO is, it's really a technology to bring communities together. And clearly that community is building technology. Um, what do you think of this thesis? Do you think that prior, your previous in your previous domains, you were seeing these feedback loops moving as efficiently or was it just different? And uh, yeah. No, it's definitely different. I've never seen any mechanism like uh, like ever that is uh, this compelling for community building. Like you know, you often look for those 10x or better improvements, and when you see that, you you should uh, take notice or take note or whatever. And I think that that's exactly what the case for sure for um, building out these types of communities and, and providing like incentive mechanisms, but also just a, I don't really know how to explain it, but it just seems like a bond between everyone that that is part of that. That uh, you can't really you can't really do in any other way, and yeah, it was just it was just really wild to see how excited and how motivated and how um, close people became from uh, being part of that community, that tokenized community. Um, even though we don't really like we we we're completely like anti speculation actually within the, the DAO. We don't even um, it's not that we don't allow that those types of discussions, but we completely are focused on uh, building out skill sets and building software and and improving you know uh software within the web3 space um and i think and i think like our thesis is that if people can come in and build out a high quality skill set then their demand uh the demand for their skill set will ride out any market and they'll be able to make money using their skill set and uh, they don't have to worry about investing um as their like way to 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 pay their bills you know and um yeah. And part of being in crypto is often like, like getting tokens as equity or, you know, you probably, the, a lot of us are definitely still buying and selling on the side, but our main focus is like around, um, you know, I would say leveling up skill sets. And during this last six to 12 months bear market, we've seen so many people that have made career acceleration. Like they've made a lot more money than they've ever made. They've done way better than they've ever done. While the the prices are going down, their like career is like going up because they've focused on learning something valuable and they're in demand. Period, and um, that's kind of like what I re really like about the community. And um, but 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 all all the people that built the community like received a big airdrop. Um, everyone that contributed received received tokens. But most people aren't like selling these tokens; they're actually giving them away because like in order to bring more people in the community, you have to have um, ownership of some uh, form of tokens to be like a contributor. We do a lot of public goods, but like to get to be part of the decision-making process, you have to have tokens. So uh, most everyone just gives their tokens away, you know, like because um, that's our way of recruiting new people and getting them in. But uh, but just having that, that mechanism there is like completely changed. I think um, the way I look at uh, how you might build communities, it's definitely a huge uh, incentive mechanism and it's, and it's, it was like a really simple way to bootstrap that community early on. Yeah. We got really excited about it before you had the code token. Um, we were doing giveaways of your NFT to early developers just to try to get them a home. Yes. With, like, I cool remember that. That was awesome. Things. So yeah, so exciting. So yeah, we keep going back to the token as one of the core innovations and, and what you just said, I was reading a, um, a thread, uh, a Twitter thread from Snowfro founder of Art Blocks the other day, just he was commenting on the open sea um, policies. And but one of his, his comments embedded in there was just sort of um, making a comment about people that play poker with the art that's being created from Art Blocks actually don't do service to the community. And I think a lot of us feel that way that like we're using tokens for something 
um, more utilitarian and, and more for organizing and, and more for membership and things like that. When people come along and play poker with them, it actually creates this like parallel incentive system, which detracts totally from the mission and the goals. And I think it's a really tricky thing to start balancing um, because that is such a core technology. Um, and so maybe let's talk about tokens a bit. Maybe, um, Akash, I'd really love to hear how you're thinking about using tokens in science DAOs, especially as you need to navigate that um, perception challenges of scientists adopting Web3 technologies. You throw tokens into the mix. How do you get, how do you, how are you thinking about communicating that around gating or incentives, governments, governance rewards, and not bringing the poker into it? And yeah, just general thoughts there. How, how are you bringing that to science? Yeah, definitely. So one note on like the poker with NFT, art blocks NFTs. Um, I've been really fascinated to watch Gitcoin um, and like their their quadratic funding experiments and quadratic voting. Um, I think generally speaking, if we can limit the impact that whales have, that can that that should be a good thing. Um, so I'm, I'm just really, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated to see this area of exploration continue in a number of different projects. Um, something that we're uh, looking heavily into as of recently is the concept of hyper certs um, that like protocol labs is working, uh, working on. Um, so the idea that you can, uh, <clears throat> the idea that you can fund um, science like crowdfunding basically through Web3 is really interesting. But then the ability to sort of reward uh, based off of like proportional contribution, I think is very interesting. And if we tie, like, if we tie these certificates, I think they're ERC 1155s. If we tie that to on chain identity, all of a sudden you do have something like reputation really being develop, uh, being developed within the decentralized science community. Maybe there's someone that has a really good eye for, um, you know, protein synthesis experiments, and there's someone that you should keep an, uh, keep watch on. Like, what are they really interested in? Um, I also think on the the token side as well, um, we're we're focusing heavily on decentralized compute, um, and so being able to gate people's access to uh, decentralized compute tooling is super important to us. Uh, Andrew, I know we're chatting with you a little bit about that um, with Tableland and some integrations there, um, but making sure the right people are accessing the right tools um, is very important. As I think as everyone knows, uh, with science, there's uh, tremendous potential for progress, but there's also tremendous potential for abuse. So um, not keeping the door like blasted completely open and making sure the right people have access to the right tools is is so important. And I think token gating, uh, Web3 token gating is the perfect way to do that. Yeah, yeah. And actually, um, that's that's one of the core pieces of, of Rebel, Mike, right? So like really thinking about how to give creators better... Uh, give give creators access to tokens specifically for gating, specifically for like saying, okay, you're part of my community, you're uh, you're going to get access to new information, new ideas. Um, how do you think creators could be using the next wave of tokens as technology, like not as you know in, investment instruments? Like, what are you thinking comes next? Yeah, so something that we're really invested in is the idea of reputation tokens. Um, so the way that they work through Rebel are they're, they're basically soul-bound tokens. They're soul-bound ERC-20s. So the idea is that on the back end, you can we have this big list of actions that people can take. Like I've posted a piece of content or people have interacted with my content or comments. Like they've reacted positively to something I've put into the system. Or I've referred a friend using my affiliate link. Or I mean, there's like a million of these things that like you can... That, that are all uh, actions that members can take. And then for each of these actions, you can assign how much reputation they should earn for that thing. Um, and every community can launch a reputation token that they can call it whatever they want to call it. And 
end users, members of communities can't transfer them. So they can't sell them, they can't create liquidity pools or move them out of the wallet. So it takes any ability for them to be speculative or to be like securities or anything like that out of the equation. And it, it essentially just becomes a value that you can accumulate. Um, and this is super duper powerful because you can, not only is that useful within the bounds of a given, of one of an, any kind of any community, but it's public and anybody can use that. So you could say like, well, yes, this person is a member of developer DAO and has accumulated all this reputation there. And that can give you access to a science compute because you have accumulated all of this reputation within another known community. And so that's sort of like cross border element of, um, and it, it, this all goes back to sort of like on-chain credentialing or reputation. I think that's going to be a major wave of, um, of, of like where we go next with a lot of blockchain community stuff. And I think it's also really powerful too, when you start to look at like retroactive rewarding, you know, if you want to call it retroactive public goods funding, which is like a hot topic in some circles, but retroactive funding in general, divvying up profit or revenues or, or whatever, um, based on people's proportional reputation that they've earned, I think is going to be something that we see happen like a lot across probably a lot of different capacities. So in the context of creators, I think you'll see stuff like early supporters getting a lot of reputation. If you get all your friends to subscribe to a podcast or to support an artist or whatever it might be, like that's a great, that it's a benefit for everybody for you to have contributed that. Um, and so like, that'll be a reputation earner. I mean, there are just all these ways that people will be able to get recognized for what they're giving back to their communities or projects. And so I think that is like mega exciting and, and a huge unlock for tokens in general and does kind of help to solve that problem of like pricing, like just like all the sort of toxicity that comes with speculation and people wanting to be in projects just because they think it's going to moon or, or, you know, pump and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you all saw, um, there's Constitution Dow too now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, I was, uh, was mentioning that when it comes to the science stuff. Like, I would love to see like science getting funded versus another attempt to buy a Constitution. <laughs> yeah, I, but I remember when the first one launched. Um, I was like kind of digging into it to figure out what was interesting there. And the one thing that uh, that popped out to me right away was that they used Juicebox Dow, which is you know just form based Dow generation. Nader, I don't know how you built or how, how the team built developer DAO and if you used a summoner or if you wrote a lot of it from scratch. Um, but I suspect that those things are just getting so much easier. So back to that point you made earlier on. Um, and I think that we've just really crossed some important boundaries in the last couple of years, in the last year, maybe, where like now, if you wanted to build a new technology, you want to build a new community around it, there are a lot of really great building blocks to do it, whether that's Lens or applications built on top of Lens, Rebel, or if you're a science community, you can be using something like LabDAO to actually spin up your own projects and leverage all the power of a DAO. Um, what's all your take on that? Is this getting easy? Like how, how easy is it now? And uh, like what comes next? What's, what are the missing pieces? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's definitely getting easier, that's for sure. And we should continue focusing on uh, making it like a lot easier in general. And I, I think it depends on like, what's the point of making it easier? Do we want to make it easier so we can continue ourselves like uh, doing all the stuff within our kind of bubble? Or do we want to open this up to, to the rest of the world? And I think that uh, we often don't realize the barrier to entry for the average person to do any of this stuff, because we're kind of like crypto native people. And a lot of us are technologists. And a lot of us are kind of, um, you know, excited about the stuff. So we're willing to kind of grind through some of the, the challenges that, that kind of come around to getting to, to know how to use this stuff. But, uh, but, in, but I would kind of like say in the real world and w what you end up seeing for uh, large applications that scale to, you know, the, the tens or even hundreds of millions of people, um, the, the friction points that we deal with would will we, we'll never uh, allow that type of mass adoption uh, as we see it today. 
you know, a lot of the, the work I, I often mention at AWS that we would see, like we would have customers that would spend uh, millions of dollars in weeks or months of time just to shave off a couple of hundred milliseconds of latency for a service that makes their app work because they were losing so many people and so much uh, money. But, uh, but we require someone to uh, understand a wallet and, and wallet seed phrases and uh, wallet uh, private keys and wallet security. We, we expect them to go find the proper token, uh, understand how to integrate it within the proper network. Um, and then we expect them to also pay for transactions. And I think that uh, all of that is just uh, unrealistic, you know, for, for 99% of the people in the world. So we need to build for like those other 99%. And I think a lot of people have realized that really most of the, um, the projects that I'm excited about are working on abstracting away a lot of that stuff. And I think that 2023 is the year of UX improvements and uh, scalability. And I think like uh, by the end of, uh, of next year, we're going to see a lot better products that are, uh, you know, improving the uh, number of, or not improving, increasing the number of like average people that can, can come in and start using this stuff without having to, to do like a crash course on blockchain stuff. I 100% agree with that. I actually just shared a, an internal blog post saying that in 2023, a lot of the protocol, infrastructure protocols and data protocols we're seeing are going to start looking a lot more like SaaS because SaaS got so many things right about the user mm -hmm. experience. And now we've kind of crossed the hump of, do, can we get these things to work? Now we need to make them work for everybody. And so I think like the graph is a great example, the graph studio, live peer studio, those are great examples of projects that are dabbling in that direction um, and making this really easy to use. W what about the other two? Do you, do you guys have thoughts on this ease of use and big challenges yeah. ahead? There, there, so, um... A demo that blew my mind that I saw recently um, was on cartridge.gg. Um, it's uh, uh, my uh, developer I know named Terrence um, and another, at least another couple of people are working on this and it's deployed to StarkNet, but through some crazy magic and account abstraction, they have reduced the a web sign in process and wallet provisioning and everything to just utilizing pass keys. So like pass keys are this new authentication form that are making their way through Chrome. I think they're supported natively on Mac OS and iOS and stuff. And all it is, is just like you do a face scan and it does an authentication and it on device and in a very user friendly way, it generates a private key and public key and uses, um, just crypto authentication in order to that, that cryptographic authentication for just saving website logins and the end user experience winds up being that you just do a face scan and it does all of that complex stuff like behind the scenes for a regular person so that you are authenticating using your biometrics and that and, and the demo that they put together was like minting uh, an NFT on Starknet um, uh, and all it required was that you like you choose a username and you hit go or whatever, and it you create a pass key by doing a, a, a Apple face scan, like a device face scan, or face ID scan. I suppose the word I'm looking for, um, and that's it. And I think that they also like the fees were also transparent. Like they they were able to do you know a fee-less transaction or whatever. And it was the first time that I did like a relatively complex Web three sort of workflow. I just tapping a button, doing a face off, face ID authentication, and then it's like, okay, done. You're all set. So I think that like on the ground, like that pass key capability and then sort of like account abstraction and funding transactions in a, in a sort of abstract way, all these things are like right on the cusp of being available broadly. And that's going to be just a major unlock. Suddenly using Web3 stuff is going to feel very like, it's going to be like the best of both worlds, really, because you're not going to be logging in with a password or an email address or going, OK, like we sent you an email code, go into your email and get your code or whatever. You're just going to face ID into like a lot of these services and apps and all of that complexity is going to be abstracted away. I also think that um, Starbucks, I think like today I saw some tweets about how they've released their polygon based loyalty app program where you collect tokens and do all this complete quests and do all of these things. So I haven't had a chance to use the app. I don't know if it's broadly available or just in beta yet, but I do think that like 
by the end of this year, I agree with Nader. Like it's this stuff is going to be like a lot more mainstream than it has been. And it's going to be really funny to think back to the times when we like were logging in with MetaMask and occasionally losing all of your assets and like, and all the complexity involved in, in all the hoops we used to jump through just to like participate in this ecosystem. So it's a really good time to be um, building because I think it's, it's, we're, you know, we're going to, we're going to probably hit the afterburners on adoption pretty soon through all of these deployments. Yeah. So one, just to kind of echo like what both of you have said, um, I think, uh, we're, so at Labdao, we're not quite at the scanning face, uh, scanning faces stage of our development cycles quite yet, but, um, we've been recently looking, um, messing around with the Taurus wallet, um, as an alternative to MetaMask. Um, it is still like one of those things where you you sign in with like a web two uh, web two login credential, but uh, by doing that, we can basically abstract the 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 web three like fun which is, should be the back end functionality to the end user. And I think just by providing this sort of login process that feels familiar to people. Um, not to say we're trying to trick them, uh, but like you should sort of like hide hide a lot of these details that don't need to that no don't need to be uh, placed front and center to the end user. Um, if we can, I think if we can do that, like we'll we'll be like well on our way to the next billion users in crypto. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. I uh, I think this is a good place to stop. That's that's the uh, that's the that's the nugget of the uh of the talk um just one last thing if people want to follow up with any of you ask you any questions about your project or any thoughts that you shared where's the best place to follow you maybe we go clockwise again yeah so um you can follow uh lab DAO. we have a twitter it's uh lab underscore dow d-a-o um and there's also a link to our discord on the lab DAO, uh, twitter profile page so you can hop in there We'd love to see you. Mike, I think you're on mute. Uh, we're on Twitter at rebel.fun, just spelled out rebel, D-O-T-F-U-N, to follow updates on what we're up to. Yeah, so we're Lens Protocol on Lens uh, and Twitter, and I'm Dabit3 on Twitter, and I'm natter.lens on Lens. Awesome. I will get the rest of those links out here, but thank you all very much for joining. Have a good rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, and uh, thank you everybody for tuning in. Thanks for having us. Thank you.